Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Axon started out of a passion for keeping agriculture moving. Imagine having 100 years of tire and wheel knowledge in your back pocket the next time you sell a piece of ag equipment. To find more or become an Axon dealer, please visit axontire.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Valley Transportation. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransinc.com for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is also brought to you by AgDirect. No matter how you buy your ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs at Valley Transportation. Our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, Ag Direct can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Sean is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. He's nice enough to come on a couple times a week and talk about what's going on. And he survived the minus cold temperatures up up in uh, what, North Dakota, right? Uh, central to Central West North Dakota. Central yeah. West North Dakota. He got he got a little taste of uh, of winter and uh, not for. Well, I took I, t- I, t- I took a deep breath and my yeah. areoli of my lungs are still uh, yelling at me like what in the world were you doing that for? Yeah, so. I can I can only imagine <laughs> that there was there was a little bit of like dude, take it easy with the deep breaths. These are for the lungs, okay? Easy. <laughs> but had a good trip and uh, got to talk to more people about some of the stuff that you've been hearing on the podcast with so Sean. Let's talk about this weather that popped through here um, the other day. We had this blast of cold air come through, and if you kind of look at weather maps here across the country in this whole winter, it's been there's been a, a pretty good sliver that kind of starts at the North Dakota Mon- or Montana line and it kind of darts down, then it kind of comes back up in you know central United States, you know southern Illinois all the way across to Ohio, back up, and then it kind of curves back into the northeast and that's where the prominent amount of, of quote unquote cold, 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 heavy snow, winter, those kind of things have all happened. And you're right. You've talked about it moving east or moving west over the time. And that I've been watching that line. And it's just getting a little bit closer to me every time. And I'm, I'm kind of on the line now. So the next storm that comes through is probably going to be, I'm going to get a, a good taste of winter here, probably here in the next uh, couple of weeks. So talk about that weather pattern that you're seeing right now. Well, remember, we started off with western based cold Mm -hmm. western based snow historic storms in the northwest and then it shifted to the east we had the historic storms the northeast the historic storms in the mid-atlantic to southeast the cold coming in and now it's starting to shift into the center now texas this week you know getting Mm -hmm. you know very very cold temperatures freeze outs of wells so we're getting more of a center-based cold center-based pattern and it should continue to migrate a little further west um, like you said, and, and, and it'd be more of a central pattern than just east or west and, and more of a broad pattern as we move into the end of February and into March. So, uh, uh, you know, that's going to mean more snow, more ice for the Midwest, uh, for the center part of the state, for Texas, and a lot more coal coming in that center part of the country. And so for natural gas production, it looks to me, you know, like the deep south, the Texas area, Oklahoma area is going to continue to get more of these kind of weather patterns like we've just seen, um, which has the most impact on imp of on um, natural gas production. So um, and I think that's I think that's gonna be the prevailing pattern through you know March and April, um, as we do expect this winter to end late and uh, and uh, and we think that's that's how this pattern's gonna finish out from 
uh, what it's done. So, so, so what I'm getting at is that everyone has had a, their chance to have some pretty extreme winter conditions, and now it's just time for the center part of the country, including your area, to finally get. I know you obviously are desperate for a little precipitation. Hopefully, you get some. Yeah, I hope so too, because we are we are needing some. Where uh, I was, you know, where I was, you know, that you no know, Dakota, West yeah. Dakota. I mean, they're just uh, definitely needing some moisture for sure. Yep. You know. Yep, and it, it feel. I mean, I could tell in the air this time that it was colder than it felt because there was a lot of moisture in the air. Um, it did snow a little bit, but nothing. I mean, like we had like an inch or something like that. But you could feel the moisture in the air, and usually when it's cold like that, you don't feel the moisture in the air. And I could tell that there was there was something there. So hopefully the next time it comes around, we get we get a good blast of snow or something like that to help regenerate. Yeah, I, 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 I would focus. I, I I think as we get to the end of the month. That's going to be the ch- big change in the in the moisture pattern for the center of the country and for your area. Um, uh, look for like you know last week of February onward to have a big change in the moisture pattern. You start to get some some precipitation coming. When the city's patterns set up, they repeat yeah. and they repeat, uh, as you know. So I think once you get set up here in late February, you know you're going to have a pretty wet March, and it'll it, it'll go a long way into you know alleviating a lot of the issues at least allow for some moisture being the ground when I go out and, and start planting. Yeah. So, yep. So interesting thing to watch and pay attention to as we move forward, especially as we look at, at planting season here, knocking on the door, not too far down the road here. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about what's going on over in the dairy market. If you take a look, what's happening there, milk is still that class three milk is still hovering around that, that 21 range. We've seen it go below 20, um, but it rapidly bounces right back up into the high twenties, low, low, uh, low 21s. And as you take a look, what's going on there, there's still that seems to be that strong demand in milk. Well, I think milk right now at this price, we remember flirting with the 2014 all time highs. Mm-hmm. And I think the market is struggling with the worry over reduced demand from that. Um, but also looking at, you know, the high feed prices that we have, um, especially for bean meal and canola meal, you know, which have really skyrocketed here lately. And, um, and, 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 and just overall cost of production. If you, if you look at the cost of production for Western dairies, for example, and you, and you know, the all in cost according to our calculations is about $20. You know, if you factor in labor and you factor in energy and you factor in feed, you know, that's the highest cost production we've ever had. So 20, you know, class three milk at 20 something isn't exorbitantly profitable. But but at the same time, there's a little, I think there's starting to be a little pushback in demand. So uh, I think ultimately we resolve ourselves to the upside. The question is, do we just do it all now and, and blow this market off or or do we have a pause I still think a pause into the latter part of the first quarter or early second quarter is preferred, um, but the market's yet to give a clear example of that. But right now, you know, I, I definitely would want to make sure if I'm a dairy producer that I just made sure I protected enough of this price that if we got a, a knockdown and I go back to losing money again uh, in terms of the price, that I can, I can get through that without having to give too much money away so I can get to the other side. Because we do see $30 milk. Uh, you know, later on in the year, it's something we've been forecasting for many years. Um, we want to we want to make sure our dairy producers participate in that cash market. So, yep. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what's going on over in um, energy markets here a little bit. Oil, West Texas Energy or West Texas Intermediate got up over ninety dollars yesterday, and uh, you know it's almost caught up with Brent. I mean, usually there's a but not there's usually some, but not much difference between Brent and West Texas. But it's a bigger gap than what we've seen right now, and we're seeing that that West Texas and Brent both are um, pretty close to each other. So I guess that's inflationary. There's some inflationary issues that we're seeing there as well. But I guess as you look what's going on in the oil market, what are your thoughts there? And because of these high oil prices that we're seeing right now, crush rates are at all times highs for soybeans and corn, both when you start looking at biodiesel and ethanol production. So what are your thoughts there on energy? It seems to me um, that, you know, the, the, at this point, the whole thing is predicated on whether the Middle East can pump more oil or not. Because Russia is obviously, the, you know, everyone's worried they're gonna, there's going to be issues with Russia oil and is it going to be available or if you know, how, how, how long will it, would it not be available? And it just seems like, like Saudi Arabia and, and the Middle East 
the OPEC countries are having a hard time increasing production like they're supposed to. They keep missing. They keep saying they're going to increase by you know, 400,000 barrels and, and, and they missed the mark. So that either means that they're just lying and they don't, they don't really want to do it, or it means that they are struggling to actually grow production. Um, either way, it's not providing the excessive supplies that everyone thought that they'd be able to turn on really quickly, and that's keeping the market on edge, especially as we get the Olympics out of the way, people are thinking Russia is going to create issues, and one of yeah. those issues is going to be messing around with energy around the world because that's a, a, a key card they have in their deck. Right. So. Yep. Okay, so you hit on natural gas earlier, and natural gas did have a pretty big run-up here uh, first of the week. I mean, it was up in the fives, and, and now we're looking at right now at, at about 41 right now. But as you, as you take a look at that natural gas, um, countries like – um, no, like Europe, for example, they were talking about that the other day in um, in like Germany, especially that they they got a little bit of reprieve from, from some cold weather, and they thought they were going to be able to make it through the rest of the winter as long as they didn't have another big blast of cold air come through, which you and I both know that's going to that's going to happen. So, looking at that natural gas and how the European situation plays into that, are you still looking at natural gas to be a big mover for you in April? Well, let's put it in perspective. Okay. If, let's say let, let's say they're correct and they just make it. Hmm. That doesn't mean they have any inventory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and remember the whole key is how are they going to be able to get those inventories up to normal before next winter? Um, I don't know. Can they? Will they? Um, if you're down to zero or close to zero, you're probably going to be very low in terms of your natural gas stocks next year. And I've just look at the U.S. Look at the rate. You know, I think we uh, drew down last week 262 um, million British thermal units for the week. And this week, with the increased cold in Texas and all and lost production, we're probably going to be over 300. You know, we're probably going to get down to the lowest inventory and in storage since the fracking revolution began, Casey. Yeah. So then it begs the question, even if we have enough to just make it through ourselves, what what kind of a what kind of inventories we're going to have going into next winter, you know? Unless we really aggressively grow uh, these um, U.S. storage uh, injections, uh, in the you know, then we're 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 going to have a, another worry next winter. So I guess what I'm getting at, I don't see that the problem is going to go away just because we just skated through. Right. The problem is still there. We still don't have enough production. We still have too much demand, and you know, I think the market has to set a price in the U.S. at a level that will allow for those storage stocks to grow much more aggressively than normal, um, and that's the job of the market. And, and you know, we can argue what that should be, but I'm not sure the price level we're at now can do that. So, yeah, 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 you're right. So you take a look at what's going on in um, in cotton. So we've talked about cotton on here quite a bit here of late. Uh, right now, cotton price is like a dollar twenty-seven, and there were some front-month contracts, like you talked about two weeks ago, that were right about a dollar, and they haven't moved off that. They're still they're still hanging around that that one dollar mark. Talking about that December twenty-two cotton. As long as uh, oil prices stay high, and how cotton competes with various you know, carbon-based um, fibers and those kind of things, you're going to see some you see a strong cotton market. So I guess as you look, what's going on there? The amount of cotton that's going to get planted this this uh, this spring going into that, and how many acres of corn in the south are going to get disrupted, which isn't necessarily a, a bunch, but it's still enough to, I think, throw a, a bit of a wrench into into the into the corn and bean marketplace. When you look at those that cotton in uh, cotton corn and bean ratio in the south, what's your thoughts there? Well. <clears throat> Definitely, we're going to plant as, as the max amount of acres that we possibly can. Right. Whatever that number is, we're going to plant it. Uh, whatever amount of equipment is available, even guys that don't, have the, that don't have the infrastructure, they're going to find the infrastructure if they can get their hands on it. Maybe they're going to call you and get some, uh, <laughs> get some cotton equipment. But, uh, um, you know, they're going to do it. The, 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 a, dollar, <laughs> a dollar a pound for new crop cotton is um, it's an awful good price. So... So I, I think that's the price. I think that price will work. Now, obviously, what's the planting conditions? You know, what kind of yield we're going to have? What kind of production? We don't know all those things, but the acres will get planted 
in large quantities to take care of the problem. The other issue is, what's the real end user demand? If we're going into a slowing economy, potentially a recession, are we overestimating consumer demand for, for clothing, for cotton? I think we are overestimating. Remember, Chinese demand for U.S. cotton is not consumer demand. That's stockpiling demand. I mean, I mean, they could be buying for a whole host of reasons, but it doesn't mean that's end user demand. Are they going to come in next year and buy with reckless abandon like they did this year? Probably not. So when I, the way I'm looking at the cotton market, I'm saying, okay, we should expect the Chinese to throttle down some. We're going to get those acres up. We're going to get production up. And the consumer demand is being overestimated. When I look at that, it says we should have a healthy build in cotton ending stocks over the next 12 months. And that means a dollar a pound for December 22 uh, cotton prices is too high based upon that supply demand outlook. Now, of course, if oil goes to 130, we'd have to recalibrate. You know, I mean, that, that's assuming, you know, where we are today, but I still think a dollar a pound is too high. And when it's all said and done, that that's going to be viewed in hindsight as a pretty good price for farmers to, to cash in, cash sale, protect whatever you want to do we just think that's going to work and, and you know obviously there can always be you know russia can go in and we can have 130 dollar oil have some kind of a geopolitical you know rogue wave event we try to make our forecast based upon what we can predict and then we just adjust with things we can't predict i can't predict the geopolitical i don't know how it's all going to play out but i'm pretty confident absent a geopolitical rogue wave there's going to be too much cotton in the world a year from now. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Now, last kind of the the big part that kind of oversees all that stuff we've talked about so far here is the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollars had some pretty big gains here this week. You've seen it shot, shoot up quite a bit, um, get quite a bit higher than what we've seen over the uh, over the past previous two weeks. And I guess as you take a look, what's going on there? What are your thoughts of the dollar and and the effect it's going to have on exports? Well. I think the logistical problems that we have moving stuff around the world has taken the strong dollar. Uh, it's made it less impactful. I mean, we have such a shortage right. of availability of supplies that it, 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 I don't think the strong dollar is having the impact that it would normally have. Right now, everyone just needs product. Doesn't matter right. what the dollar is. Just I need it. I can't get it. The shipping's delayed. I'm six months behind in getting my shipments. Just get it. And so I think that has, has largely taken that typical relationship off the table and has kept our exports pretty strong because of the lack of availability. Now, one day, you would hope we would solve our logistical problems. And if we do, then the dollar comes back to being more important. But for right now, I think it's a less impactful uh, metric for U.S. ag exports. Um, and, I, and right now, you know, I, I do not see yet material improvements in logistical issues. In fact, the cold winter and some of the additional policies that we've seen uh, around the world you know, have made logistics equally as challenging. So right now, I think the strong dollar is not going to change the need for U.S. agricultural demand. So, Gotcha. All right. Lastly, let's hit on this one last topic here because of where the price of wheat is as compared to the price of um, rice. So when you're looking at rice prices right now, um, you know we've seen we've seen some some ebbs and flows in both of those marketplaces and, and and the back and forth there, and you start talking about shortages of wheat supplies around the world as well as as rice supplies around the world. When you're looking at those two things and how they interact with each other, what are your thoughts on those products? Well, right now, if we take the ratio of rice to casey wheat, for example, um, it's two. Uh, you know, rice is around 15 and wheat's around uh, seven and a half. Mm -hmm. So that's two. The, the, the historical relationship, we did it in a relationship of a thousand years of data of the price relationship between rice and wheat and found that um, any time that the price of wheat is, is two times the price of, every, every time that the price of rice is two times the price of wheat or less, it's extremely undervalued and you get substitution demand. Anytime that the price of rice gets three times the price of wheat, it's too expensive and you get substitution demand the other way. So right now, rice is priced for huge demand um, as substitution because if you can't get the wheat, you can't afford the wheat, um, you're going to buy the cheaper rice to feed your families, especially out in Asia. So I would view rice as a market that's being underestimated 
in terms of the demand for the product. Um, and that's going to be the big uh, surprise. Now, remember, we're going to be moving away from La Nina towards El Nino. When I, when I speak at your conference here in September, it's going to be a big change in, in moving towards El Nino. El Nino means a lot of dryness out in Asia where they grow a lot of the rice. So you have a situation where we're going to have a slingshot in demand away from wheat over to rice, just as we're going to have challenging crops in Asia due to El Nino creating dry, you know, drought in India, drought in Thailand, Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, these places that they grow a lot of rice. So, so, so rice looks very interesting to us. We think it's an undervalued, mispriced ag market that uh, we'll need to reprice higher. And so we think, uh, and aspect, on top of it, is a very, very high a user of fertilizer. Yeah. And so the cost production based on the fertilizer is extremely high. So we think the acres are going to be very, very challenging to get in the ground in the quantities that will be needed. So so it's a really good setup right now for for rice to um, kind of do some catching up to what the wheat market's been doing. So right. yep. Okay. Well good stuff as usual, Sean. Folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing over there at Hackett Financial. What's the best way to do that? Our website is Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, advisors.com. We have all kinds of information on there to let your listeners know more about what we do to see if we can be of some value. And we might be opening up a North Dakota office. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a bit of a shock for your for your sister. You have to go there in the summertime. A virtual, it'll be, it'll be a virtual a office. Virtual office. Just have a TV, <laughs> just have a TV in, the, in the room. You walk in there. Tap on the, tap on the window and boom. Don't get me wrong. Deal. Beautiful state, lovely, lovely country, amazing people. Just horrible temperature for me, at least. Temperature so. is I'm, well. I'm pretty sure it's that way for most most people that they're there. So, yeah. Summers are nice though. They are nice. Yeah. And, and so nice. I, I I plan to schedule more meetings in July. There you go. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Sean, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Thanks, Casey. See you next week. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you find the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast. Also, go to movingironllc.com for all the latest information about the Moving Iron Summit coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, September 6th, 7th, and 8th in uh, downtown Hilton down there, in uh, right down the strip there in um, Broadway there in, in uh, Nashville. So, if you'd like more information about that, send me an email at moving iron podcast at moving iron podcast.com and I'll get back to you with all the great information about that. So, with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett. Let's go with some iron folks. Out. Axon Tire is going to have more tips, tricks, and client advice throughout the year and in September at the Moving Iron Summit in Nashville. If you're looking to sign up for the event, please head over to moving iron LLC.com. We hope to see you there. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 or go to valleytransitinc.com for all of your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. And no matter how you buy ag equipment from a dealer, auction, or a private party, AgDirect can help you finance it. You can even apply online at agdirect.com. Learn more about your financing options at agdirect.com. Moving higher in the 21st century